Hello, and thank you for joining us for another inspiring message from Journey Church. To learn more about our ministries, please visit us online at journeychurch.org. Now here is today's message. All right, say this with me. God is great. His word is true. And it works in my life. Now, each week we say that, we repeat it back, and I'm going to ask you today, do you believe what you just said? Now you're a little unsure. He's like, "Uh uh-oh, he's going to get me later for this. Are you sure? God is great. His word is true. How many believe that? And it works in my life. Well, what if we said that there's some areas in our life that might not line up with God's word? And we need to talk about those things just a little bit today in the context of relationships, in the context of marriage, and in the context of life in general. Because if we believe what we just said to be true and we don't apply it, then we're destined for some trouble. Because what I've found in my life is that when I do things God's way, it tends to work out all right. When I don't do things God's way, I tend to get myself in trouble. Has anybody experienced that as well? All right, so some of you are just real gluttons for punishment, I guess. That, that's, what we're, that's what we're talking about today. So if you would, bow your heads and close your eyes. And Father, we thank you for this day. And as we come to the conclusion of this Real Marriage and Family series, We're just so grateful for the victories that we've already heard about during the course of this series of families that, you know, have been restored, of couples that are getting married as a result of what they've heard, of just a variety of different wins we've seen happen as miracles have happened in the lives of the families of Journey Church. So, Lord, we ask you that today would be another day like that, that today would be a day that informs, surely, that we gain new information that we might apply in our lives, but more than that, that today would be a day that transforms for many, that our thoughts, our minds, our actions are transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we uh, walk forward from this place better ready to image you and mirror you to a lost and hurting world in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. Amen. So we're ready to get started. We're concluding this Real Marriage series. We've studied a lot of different topics over the past few weeks. And if this is your first week here, I encourage you to go online and watch any of the past messages. We even have some out there absolutely free in the lobby where you can pick up a copy of the CD or DVD and continue on in your learning. Now, the first day of any relationship is always a good day, right? It's usually passionate. It's exciting. And the first day being our wedding day when we enter into a wedding-like relationship is also a very important day. It's a day that most young ladies and even guys dream about all of their early life. They dream about that day that you're going to walk out, you know, maybe on a white horse out there into to the wedding. You, you dream about what the cake's going to look like and what dress you're going to wear and what venue it might be at. And we all have these aspirations. And for some of you, that dream was fully realized. You had the wedding of your dreams. For others of us, like myself, we made some mistakes that we shared with you with regards to our relationship, and we had what is known as the shotgun wedding, right? Any any of those in the house? Anybody willing to admit? Okay, I see one. Do I hear two? Only two or three of us. The rest of you are in the wrong place today, right? Because some of us got issues, you know, and the, the cool part is it doesn't matter how you started in Christ, it's all about how you finish, It's the finishing well that really matters. So, you know, we put a lot of effort into that first day, into the cake, into the venue, into the money, into everything that's involved with that wedding day. But we need to put a little bit of attention of the same type into the rest of our days, into making a plan to be successful. Because in life, what happens is we're very passionate as those initial relationships get off the ground. But there are difficult days that we experience in our lives, and sometimes that passion does wane during those difficult circumstances. And if you don't have a plan to get you through those tough times, let me tell you, many marriages, even friendships, end up on the rocks because we haven't taken the time to plan. The Bible says this. It says in Ecclesiastes 7, 8, the end of a thing is better than its beginning. We put a lot of effort into the beginning, like I said, but the Bible tells us that the end of a thing is better than its beginning. So how will that relationship end? How will that friendship end? How will that marriage relationship, if you're married, end for you today? Will it end someday at your spouse's bedside where you're full of regrets as they pass on to be with the Lord, where you've made all kinds of mistakes and you haven't repented for them and you, you, you feel their passing is too soon because you haven't made things right? 
Will it end, unfortunately, in divorce for some of us? because we were unwilling to humble ourselves, we were unwilling to put aside our own selfish self-centeredness to put someone else before us in our marriage relationship? Or will it end someday as your loved one goes on to be with the Lord where you're like, man, thank you for a life well lived. Thank you for the opportunity that I had to spend with them in this life. I look forward to an eternity of spending life with them walking on streets of gold. That is what we're after here, do you agree? That's what we want, and it happens in marriage, but let me tell you, if you're not married here today, these same principles apply to our friendships. How many of our friendships have been ruined because we were selfish or self-centered and we didn't put the interests of our friends first? These same things that we're talking about today apply in virtually any context, including work relationships, maybe except for the first thing that we're going to discuss in a moment. So during the course of this series, I've been pretty hard on us, challenging us to repent where we needed to repent because we talked about this issue that sinners say, I do. And we all approach, uh, you know, approach relationships with this sinful self-centeredness in our heart that needs to be crushed so that the two can become one in Christ, right? So we've, we've had some hard days. I'm going to be a little bit hard on you today too because I believe that there's one area of marriage relationships that is a real killer for families and we need to deal with that today. But then I'm going to give you some tips, some very practical tips on love about how people give and receive love that you might apply in your life to keep you from ever coming to that point in life where you say, I don't feel like I'm in love anymore. How many of us have heard that from a friend? That the relationship was ending. I don't feel like I'm in love anymore. We're going to address that. And the third thing we're going to talk about is really putting God first in our relationships as we bring the message to a close today. So I want to highlight three things. They have to do with planning to be successful in your marriage, in your life. Putting God first, putting a priority on each other, and a plan for our finances. Why do I bring up finances Statistics tell us that 37% of marriages in America end because of financial mismanagement. It's a conversation that I am sure the majority of us here in this room would find apropos for today. You're going to say, yeah, that is a real issue in our life. We're challenged in the area of our finances today. For a select 1%, you know, you got the 99% of us. And then you got the 1% of us. There's 1% of you that maybe this isn't an issue for you. You got your finances all taken care of. And unfortunately for some of you who find yourself in that place, your finances have become your God. Your finances have given you that sense of security that has kept you from a relationship with God. Your finances have given you a sense of comfort that has kept you from a relationship with God. Your finances have given you a sense of affirmation that has kept you from a relationship with God. And the rest of us, we have some other issues that we have to deal with regarding this issue of finances, especially in the context of relationships. So marital problems, 37% of divorces in our day and age are derived from this issue. So we need to tackle it well as part of this series. Would you agree? I don't want to see families' lives ruined over this issue of money. Cash flow, 70% of consumers in our day and age live paycheck to paycheck. When it comes to savings or retirement, nearly half of all Americans, 46%, have less than 10% saved for their retirement. Do you know what that means? There is no retirement, right? If you have 10% saved or $10,000 saved, you are not going to retire. We need to talk about these things. And unfortunately, when we talk about starting well and finishing well, most of us, I venture to say, in this room did not start well in this area. Maybe a few of you, the lucky few of you, put these principles to work. Most of you are coming at the topic I'm talking today from not necessarily a position of strength. And there's two things that need to happen. You need to either be informed today, and ultimately you need to be transformed today. What do I mean by that? There was a guy that came into my office today. He's a leader in the church, and he loves God, and he loves his wife. And we were talking about relationships, and we're saying, you know, what, what's going on? Tell me about where your struggles lie in your relationship. And he goes... Eric, if I were honest, you know, it's always about finances. The problem that we're having, the, the conversations seem to always surround finances. He goes, Eric, we make good money 
We make good money, but for some reason, it seems like there's never anything left at the end. He says, we'll end up walking into Walgreens or we'll end up walking into Walmart. And before you know it, we're walking out with $200 worth of stuff. And then we have nothing left in our bank account. And I said, well, have you ever taken any courses like you know, Financial Peace University? Have you read anything? Did your parents teach you about finances? And he's like, no, nah, man, I've just kind of, if we were honest, we're going at it by the seat of our pants. We're winging it when it comes to this area. So in a certain way, his understanding of finance is God's way. He needs information about that. I said, well, can I give you a book about this? Would you be willing to read it if I gave you the book? Would you consider signing up for a class like Financial Peace University? Would you get with somebody and talk about how to lead your finances well? Because in this case, the guy genuinely has a heart after God. I don't think it's an issue where he's trying to sin in his finances. He just doesn't have an understanding of that. And for some of you today, you're at that place. Maybe you were never taught how to lead your financial life well. Fortunately, I grew up in a home where my dad had a business. I watched him. I aspired to be like him. He managed the household finances exceptionally well. He managed the business finances well. So I learned from that. And then as a result of that, I went to business school. And we went to business school and continued to grow in that learning. And then when we got saved, we started to learn what it meant to lead our finances God's way. Now, does that mean there was never any trouble or any difficulty in our finances? No, there were certainly moments of trouble, mostly by my own creation, by the addictions that I had in other areas of my life that caused me to mismanage money at certain times of my life. But there's parts of it that I got right, and there's other parts that I need to continue to grow in. I don't know where you're at today as you hear this message, but I venture to say that all of us can grow with regards to this area of our life. So let's talk practical for a minute, and then we're gonna talk scriptural. Um, if you were to live out from an early age in your life, what I call the 80-10-10 rule, you would be very successful. So this is primarily for the young people in the house. Maybe you're in high school, maybe you're in college. I got blessed to get saved when I was 22 years old. So we applied this very early in life. It's much easier to put this into practice when you're just getting started because it just makes life easier. So what's the 80-10-10 rule? You give 10% to God, you save 10%, and you live off of 80% of your income. You see, I've only met one person in life who has ever gotten into trouble with their finances because they were overly generous. Just one. We actually filmed them. We listened to the testimony. This guy actually had a mental deficiency, to be completely honest with you, where he could not completely discern how to deal with finances. So he heard God's word and he said, give it away to keep it. And he gave it all away. <laughs> you know? And some of us had to go to him and say like, dude, there's, there's some, you got to keep some of it because there's bills you have to pay. And then when he got that information, he's like, okay, this makes sense. But it was hard for him to discern. But in his heart, man, you could just see this spirit that he had to give it all away because man, he heard what God's word said and he was putting it into practice. You know, most of us don't get into trouble because we're overly generous. Most of us get into trouble, if we're honest, because we overly consume, right? We spend more than we bring in. For many of us, we've gotten to that place where we're spending all 100%. You're not saving. You're not putting any money in the bank for the future. You're not putting any money in the bank in case you lose your job or for the tough times that might come in the future. You spent so much that, in fact, you've edged God out. You feel that you can't give God the 10%. You feel that it's impossible to give that 10%. Well, in fact, you might be worshiping another God. Why do I say that? We'll dig into that just a little bit deeper. But if you're consuming to the degree where, say, you, have, you give more money to your Jaguars tickets per year than you do to God, that's a problem. If you give more money to AT&T or Verizon so that you could pay for your smartphone at $240 per month and you give God less than that, then you probably have a problem. If you have a big flat screen TV that costs more in one year than you give to God, then let me tell you, you probably have a problem.